Father, thank you once again that we have this privilege tonight of just spending some time in your presence, of allowing, to, allowing us to worship you, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, and allowing us to study your word. Father, open your word once again to us. Let us hear with ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, and let us act according to your will for the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you'd like to take your seats, thank you, team. We're going to come to our Revelation Bible study. We are in chapter 11. Just to remind you what we looked at last time, just to recap. We looked at last time, we looked at the rebuilding of the temple. We looked at how uh, the outer court was given to the Gentiles. And we looked at two witnesses who were prophesying. Uh, at the halfway period of the seven-year tribulation. We know it's the halfway period because it tells us so. And so we're remembering that what the Apostle John has been told, if you remember, in chapter 10, he was told that he must prophesy again. So just remember the, the chronological outline of Revelation right back at the beginning two years ago when we started this study, John was told in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19 that he has to write what he has seen, what now is, and what is yet to come. And we looked at how what he had seen was the life of Christ and the revelation of Jesus that he had seen in his life. Because remember, he wrote the Gospel of John as well. What now is, is the church age, which was up to chapter 4. But then at the beginning of chapter 4, it starts by twice stating we are now in the after this period, the metatauter in Greek, the hereafter, what is yet to come. So we are obviously in the what is yet to come period tonight, chapter 11, but we've seen that there is a pause at the halfway period, and John has been told to, to say it again. In other words, give amplification give more information, more detail, more narrative about what has already been going on, as well as continuing the narrative and the chronology. So it's still in a broad chronology, but he's now at the halfway stage filling in information about what's been going on. Because there's so much, obviously, he sees, it's very hard to record it without having to pause and stop and give details about a specific period of time. This is what's happening in chapter 11. He's describing what's happened during the first half of the tribulation. The two witnesses, how they've been giving a, a testimony of what true knowledge of God is. Remember, Antichrist is already here at this time, and so they are pointing people towards the truth. And we got down to verse 6 of chapter 11. So if we go to Revelation chapter 11 and verse 7, let's pick up from where we left off last time. Okay, so they're doing everything that they have been commissioned to do. We looked at who they were now, in verse 7, it says, Now, when they have finished their testimony, that's at three and a half years, exactly halfway through the week, as we know this is when Antichrist reveals himself. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss, we look to him in chapter 9, who he really is, he's Satan himself, but in an incarnate form, from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. They have finished their ministry. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. Look at what that means in a moment. Where also their Lord was crucified. Let's read down. For three and a half days, some from every tribe, nation, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies. So the whole world, if you read the King James Version, the whole world can see these bodies which in itself is a revelation of something. Reviews them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them, will celebrate by sending each other gifts, because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Let's just read down right to the, uh, to the end of the chapter. 
They heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second war has passed. The third war is coming soon. Actually, I think, I think we'll just stop there. We'll stop at verse 14. We'll pick up after that in a moment. Okay, so what's happening? Antichrist is going to kill the two prophets, the two testimony. He's going to wipe out a testimony to the truth. At that point, everyone sort of will have to live by the knowledge they've got. Because Antichrist is going to follow the, the example of all Antichrist previously. He's going to technically make it illegal to be a true believer anywhere on the earth. And he's going to kill anyone, as we'll see later in chapter 13 onwards, who does not worship him. Because at the middle of the week, in the middle of the seven-year period, as we've seen, he's going to demand that people worship him as God. So the two witnesses are here. We looked uh, somewhat at what the witnesses uh, represented throughout the Bible. Remember, when Jesus uh, died, there were two witnesses. There was two thieves on either side of him, testifying to who he was. When he uh, rose from the grave, there were two men at the tomb doesn't tell us who they are. We tend to think they're angels. For all I know, it could be the same witnesses. Uh, when he ascended to heaven, two men appeared and told the apostles where he'd gone. So related to Jesus' ascension and return, there's, there's going to be two witnesses. Uh, and then we looked at lots of other examples last time. So I'll not go, I'll, I'll not go into that. So they killed. The Antichrist kills them. And so what we've got now happening is a bit of narrative about what's going on in this period. Now, it's the beast that comes out of the abyss that kills them, right? If we go to verse 7, it's this beast, this thing that we looked at, this fallen cherub, this angelic being, Apollyon, who claims to be the son of God. We looked at who he is. He's a representation of Satan himself. He is Satan himself. So he kills them, he attacks them, and he overpowers them. Now, remember what we've just read at the beginning of chapter 11. The temple has been rebuilt. Yeah? You remember he was told to go and measure the temple, even though at the time of writing there was no temple. There still isn't a temple, but they're getting ready to rebuild it at any moment. So at this moment, exactly halfway through, Antichrist, as is prophesied, decides he is going to put himself in the temple. It may be that this is the point where the temple is finally finished. Could be. Because if you follow the narratives throughout the Bible, whenever God builds a temple, there is always an antichrist there waiting in the wings. Have you ever noticed that? There always is. When Solomon built his temple, the king of Tyre was helping with the building program. He was actually providing the, the cedars of Lebanon to build the temple. He was, he was providing the stonemasons, the Phoenicians. And, if, and when you read Ezekiel and uh, Isaiah chapters 14 and 28, you'll see that he's, a, he's, he's actually the devil himself. The king of Tyre is a picture of Satan. So Satan's helping build the temple. Why would Satan do that? If it's God's temple, why does Satan always help building the temple? In Jesus' time, who rebuilt the temple? Herod. Herod. Well, is Herod a good guy? No, he's an actual direct picture of Antichrist. He's the one who claimed to be the king of the Jews, but he wasn't the king of the Jews. He was actually a false king of the Jews. And what did he do when the true king of the Jews appeared? Tried to kill him tried to kill all the children in Bethlehem. What did he do to the, one of the witnesses who appeared? John the Baptist killed him. So can you see the pattern is continually repeated? Whenever the temple is going to be built, when God's, God's going to reinstitute the temple, Satan knows what's happening. Satan might even finance the building of the temple. Don't think just because someone is going to help the Jews, that means he's a good guy. Satan's going to help the Jews. He needs to help the Jews because he needs to build this so that he can project himself into that position. You'll often find that the king of the Jews often turns out to be a an type of antichrist. King Saul, you've got King David, the true anointed king, you've got King Saul. What's he trying to do? Kill the true king because he wants to be king. Satan is not dumb. 
Don't go along with all the political nonsense that's in the media. Just because someone pretends they're on God's side doesn't mean they are. They might be using that to project a platform for themselves that they're going to seize at some future time. Be very careful when you start getting involved in politics. It's very dangerous. I'll, I'll, t- I'll take that no further. I'll end up mentioning names. And I don't want to do that. It was the same when Nehemiah and Ezra came back to build the temple, the king of Persia. Yeah, it was the time, same time in the Greeks, Antiochus Epiphanes. The Greeks started to help the Jews to start with, and then he decided he'd make himself God. It was the same with the Romans. They gave the Jews liberty uh, to start with, but by the time of Hadrian, he destroys it all, and he builds a temple to Jupiter, which was his God. Jupiter uh, is actually a picture of Satan himself. The Bible tells us, as we read there in the, the letters to the churches, he was the, uh, the, the Roman version of Zeus, who is uh, a picture of Satan. So can we see what's happening now? He's got what he wants, so he kills the people, he seizes control, he puts himself in the temple, and as prophesied in Daniel, he doesn't show them even public dignity, he lets the bodies die in the public square, the great city, he gloats over them, he claims he's now got rid of these interfering believers who are pointing people towards God, he's killed them, he's got rid of them, now what we need to understand is John is now giving us narrative and he's giving us preparation for what is going to happen, the beast kills the two witnesses because... He needs to establish his own two witnesses. So this is the preparation, the foundation for what he's going to do next. So if you go to chapter 13 and verse 1, where John gives us even more detail about the Antichrist. So he kills the two witnesses. What does this beast from the the abyss, who's Satan himself, what does he do? The dragon stood on the shore of the sea. I saw a beast coming out of the sea. Ten horns, seven heads, ten crowns. We'll look at those another time. We can't cover them tonight. On its horns, each had a blasphemous, blasphemous name, right? So he establishes one beast, then if you go to verse 11, we won't get onto this tonight, then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth, it had two horns like a lamb but it spoke like a dragon, we'll look at that next time, so can you see he gets rid of two true witnesses that are prophesying to the whole earth and he establishes two false witnesses two beasts who are in his image. They look like a dragon. And it's the dragon that appoints them. We'll look at the dragon in a minute. So can you see what John's trying to get us to see? The Antichrist is removing all the, everything that's good so that he can implement everything that is of him. We're seeing that happening in our society now. Don't think that people who pretend they're being neutral by saying we need to remove this. Don't think they're being impartial. That will be replaced by something evil. When you remove God from anything in society, you don't have a vacuum, you end up with something bad. You end up with false testimony. That's what we're seeing happening right now. And so therefore, when he does this in chapter 11, before we get to chapter 13, there's another chapter in between chapter 11 and chapter 13. Does anyone know what that chapter's called? Chapter 12, well done. Before the end of chapter 11 and chapter 13, there is chapter 12. Tonight, we were going to focus on chapter 12. Because chapter 12, many theologians think, is one of the most, if not the most important, chapter in the Bible. That's quite a statement. Especially since no one can agree on what chapter 12 means. But don't worry, I'm going to tell you what it means tonight. I'm going to tell you what I think it means, okay? So let's just go back to chapter 11, round chapter 11 up then. So verse 8 of chapter 11 says something a bit strange here. So this is happening in Jerusalem. The temple's built. The the true believer, the true uh, witnesses are killed. Their bodies will lie in the public square, this great city. What city is he talking about? Figuratively, it's called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Now, there's only one city he's talking about, but... Why does he call it this? Now, he's talking about Jerusalem, because Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. But he calls it Sodom and Egypt. 
We've got to understand that what's actually happening throughout this period and at this time, although the temple is rebuilt, although the Jews are brought back to Israel, although Jerusalem is established as the capital, remember this is all done whilst the Jews are still in unbelief. They're actually still following Antichrist. They will choose the wrong leader. Jesus says, you don't accept me when I come in my father's name. You will accept him who comes in his own name. They will choose. They chose Barabbas instead of Jesus. They chose Saul instead of David. The Jews will always choose the wrong one before they get the right one. It's the second time he comes that they choose the right leader. And so it's called Sodom and it's called Egypt. Now, Egypt is always a representation in the Bible of luxurious living. Whenever somebody wanted to get away from poverty and just live in uh, materialism and self-satisfaction, they'd go down to Egypt. That's why God told them, don't go down to Egypt. And Sodom is a representation of sexual immorality. I think we're pretty much aware of that. So what God's showing us that at this, mo- at this time, the Jewish nation, Jerusalem, this place, is actually full of unbelief. It's following the sexual immorality of the world. It's seeking materialism and luxury just like everybody else. And it's far from God. It's only at the end of this period they're going to turn back to God. And we might see that tonight. But we'll certainly see it before the end of the book of Revelation. So the spiritual condition of Israel at this time, although God has done everything he said, restored the land, restored the nation, restored the capital city, restored the temple, they're still in unbelief. They're still not turning to God. They still just want to do their own thing. And that's why it's called Egypt and Sodom. And it reminds them that they had all that 2,000 years ago. And they still crucified their Messiah. Still followed Antichrist. What did they say? Caesar is our king. Who's Caesar? He's the Antichrist. He was the Antichrist of the day. They wanted peace at all costs. And they didn't want the true Messiah. Now it says everyone sees this. Now some people latch onto this. And say this must be a technology statement. Because there has been no moment in time. Where everybody could see what was happening in Jerusalem. Until literally now. Only our generation. Can you press the TV. And you can watch what's happening in Jerusalem. You can, there's actually live cams on the Temple Mount. And on the Kotel. The Western Wall area. You can log on your, uh, your internet. Go onto the webcams. You can watch live what's happening right there right now. That's only been possible in the last few years. It's never been possible in the previous 6,000 years of human history. So it shows that the technology is there. For this to be happening right now. Okay, they don't bury them. Everyone's happy. Everyone's glad. They finally got rid of these people who keep confronting them with the truth. Notice it's, it's there. It's Sodom and Egypt. So what are the two things that they're being confronted on? They don't want to be confronted on false sexual ideas, and they don't want to be con- confronted on the worldly standards that they're living in. That's the two things today that people will not let Christians talk about. You can have your beliefs, but don't talk to us about sexual immorality or sexual behavior. And don't tell us that our world system is wrong. But they're the two things God is going to confront. So all those, notice verse 10, the inhabitants of the earth, or in the Greek, the the earth dwellers are happy. Not the heaven dwellers. Not those who are heavenly people. They're not happy. But the earth dwellers are happy. Those whose home is on this earth, they're all happy. But what does God do? Verse 11. After three and a half days, the breath of life from God, the ruach, the spirit of God, breath, spirit, pneuma, it's the same word, stand on their feet. Everyone's terrified. And they hear a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. They went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. It's the same word for rapture, hapatso. They're taken up to heaven. Remember, there's, there's lots of raptures in the Bible. They went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. Clouds are always a picture of ascending and descending between heaven and earth. Clouds will be evident at the second coming of Jesus. So we see the cloud there also. Now, what happens next? Verse 13 So they've been testifying to the truth. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. 
The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. So John is here reminding us that we're still in a chronological system. He's just giving a lot more detail. Actually, chapters 11 through to 14 are actually in brackets, parentheses, and he's giving us detail between. The actual, the, the final uh, set of judgments, the bold judgments, are not actually going to come for three more chapters yet. We're in this big gap. The gap between each event gets bigger in Revelation. And that's where sometimes people lose their, lose their bearings and forget the chronology. Okay, now look at what happens in verse 13. A tenth of the city collapsed and 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. Now why those two figures? Why does it give us two different numerical values there, a tenth and 7,000. I think the reason that God uses those two mathematical numbers is because in the Old Testament, what did those two numbers mean? What is a tenth? It's the tithe. But what is the tithe? You see, all the way through the Old Testament, especially if you look in the, in the Levitical Code of chapter 27, we'll not go there. God says the tenth is his. The tithe is actually a means of grace. It's a means of you recognizing you belong to God. Yeah, God says, I will take the Levite, Levites as his tithe. In fact, God, when God brought judgment through Isaiah chapter 6, when he prophesied judgment was coming, he said a tenth will remain in the land. In other words, there's always 10% that belongs to God and is protected and it's his. That's why when you tithe, you're recognizing that you are God's. You belong to him. So the tenth belongs to God in the time of Moses. Now remember, who were the two witnesses? Moses and Elijah. So when God showed Moses what belonged to him, he showed him the tenth, the tithe. The tithe is mine. When Elijah was shown who belonged to God, what did God show him? He said, there are 7,000 who belong to me. I have reserved them. They are mine. They don't bow the knee to Baal. Baal is a picture of Antichrist. They don't worship him. They don't belong to him. And that's in 1 Kings chapter 19. So the two witnesses were told that these two numbers were the representation of what belongs to God. Yeah? Moses and Elijah. Moses was shown it's the tenth, a tenth, whatever, Jerusalem, the income, whatever it is, always a tenth of whatever. And Elijah was shown it was 7,000. Now, instead of God saying, this is mine, he does the opposite. He destroys the tenth, and instead of reserving 7,000, he kills 10,000. What is God doing? He is showing that under the old dispensation of grace, where the tenth was his and the remnant was saved his, God is now showing grace is over. There is no tenth. There is no 7,000. That's going to be destroyed, and this is going to die. The period of grace has ended. You've killed the witnesses, just like you killed the Messiah. It's Sodom and Egypt now. There is no more grace. You can't now give a tithe and say, this belongs to God. No, you don't belong to me. This world now becomes Satan's. You can't say there's these all 7,000 reserved as a remnant. No, 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 no. You're all worshipping Baal now. The ones who are worshipping, you've killed them. I've had to take them to heaven. So God, again, is reinforcing through, another, again, another rapture. He's taking it to heaven. He's now saying, right, now judgment is coming. The second woe is past. The third one's coming. There's only three. Now the final set of judgments are coming. These are going to be horrendous. But we're not going to see them until chapter 14 onwards. Because he's still going to give us the narrative of what's happening in the world. Because John's prophesying again and explaining what's going on through this chronology. So go to verse 15. So he's told us it's now accelerating. So the seventh angel now is going to sound the trumpet. Remember at the end of each seven there's a pause and another set of seven is coming. So out of the seventh trumpet there's going to come seven bowls. But we're not going to see them for a few more chapters. He's filling in the narrative in between. 
So when the seventh trumpet is sounded, loud voices in heaven, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever. So these voices are in heaven. So heaven is now preparing for the return. The kingdom is now coming. There's just the final stage, this final three and a half years that the Bible talks about more than any other period of history. They're now in that final preparation stage. So in heaven, they're saying, right, this is it now. The kingdom's coming. But there's still going to be this period of three and a half years on earth. And so they're just reinforcing it before all this happens. They're reinforcing what's going to happen. The 24 elders who were seated on the thrones before God fell on their faces and they worshipped God. So this is it now. What's God still showing us before this final judgment comes? We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. He hasn't come to reign yet. There's still three and a half years. But Jesus is now beginning this final preparation of the three and a half years. He's going to return in chapter 19. But he's now showing us what's happening in heaven. They're getting ready. You know, they're putting the saddles on the horses. Whatever they're doing in that final, uh, and that's metaphorical, but whatever they're doing in that final stage, they're getting ready. Three and a half years isn't long to get ready when you've got to destroy the earth and rebuild it again. So it's all getting ready in heaven. The nations were angry. Your wrath has finally come. These last judgments are going to be the consummation of God's wrath where most of the planet is going to be annihilated. This time has come for judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets. Rewards are going to be being given out in heaven. Your people who reveal your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. God is going to destroy everything that causes destruction. Remember, one of the names of the Antichrist is the destroyer. He's going to destroy everyone who belongs to the destroyer. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the Ark of the Covenant. There came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. You remember when we looked at what the thunders are? Whenever you see this thunder in heaven, it's now saying we now approach, we're now at the next stage. Yeah, we looked at seven thunders, and we looked at God is now moving on to the next stage. And then there's going to be hailstorm, rocks, hail falling from the sky. Remember, God's method of punishment wasn't cutting someone's head off or crucifixion. How did God punish people? It's not a trick question. It's in the Mosaic law. When someone blasphemed, what had to happen to them? They threw stones at them. All the way through the Bible, you stoned someone. God's punishment on the earth is stones are going to fall on the earth. That is proof that God is doing it. Stones, large stones. Some of these stones are huge. We'll we'll look at them another time, though. So the earthquake, the thunder that we've looked at before, this is a, a seal now of what's happening. But what have we just seen? Then God's temple in heaven was opened. Within his temple was seen the Ark of the Covenant. So the temple's open. By the way, how many things do you th- how many how many things are opened in heaven? In the book of Revelation. How many things are opened in the book of Revelation? Seven. What an interesting concept. Seven, anyone want to guess what seven things are opened in the book of Revelation? Heaven is opened. Yeah, that's there. Okay, study that in your own time. Seals. Doors. Scrolls. Anyway, study that in your own time. I don't want to go down a rabbit trail looking at the seven, seven different things are opened in the book of Revelation. So, when heaven is opened, what is seen? The temple and the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah? Have you seen any of these documentaries on where the Ark of the Covenant is? You can log on YouTube. There's been lots of documentaries on people looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Where is the Ark of the Covenant? In heaven. When did it go to heaven? heaven. Yes. It was always in heaven. When Moses went up the mountain, what did God tell him? He said, make on earth a copy of everything you have seen in heaven. The temple has always been in heaven. The Ark of the Covenant was always in heaven. The altar was always in heaven. The incense, the worship was always in heaven. It was always in heaven. The replica was on earth. So the Ark of the Covenant is 
In heaven, it always has been. Where was the, where's the replica then on earth? Anyone know where that is? There's three theories of where the Ark of the Covenant is on earth. Do you want to know what they are? Okay. The, the, the first theory, there's, there's loads of people uh, got ideas about where this is. There's like lots of Indiana Joneses out there trying to find the, the lost ark. I'm a Jones, so I know where it is. It's in heaven. I asked our Indy where it was, and he told me. Right, theory number one is the ark is in Ethiopia. Now, there is circumstantial evidence that that could be so. The theory is that uh, Menelik, who was the son of the Queen of Sheba, who was the illegitimate son of Solomon, uh, took the ark down into Ethiopia for safekeeping. There is a city called Aksam in Ethiopia where they have a fortress compound and no one's allowed in except special priests. And the priests say the ark of the covenant is in there, but we're not going to let you look at it. Now, that's a total theory. It's total conjecture. There's no more evidence other than that. So I'm not saying it's there. The other theory is it's in Jerusalem, probably under the Temple Mount. There are some rabbis claim they have found it, but they're not going to let anyone see it because they haven't got anywhere to put it. Now, is that, is that true? I have no idea. It is possible. Is it probable? I don't know. Third theory is that Temple Neko, when he conquered Jerusalem, took the ark to Egypt. Now, that is that evidence for that is in the Bible, but whether he brought it back or not, Nobody knows. And that's why in Raiders of the Lost Ark, they think it's in the city of Tanis because that was the main treasure city of the Pharaoh at that time. And so before the Nazis got it, the Jones has got it. So <laughs> whether the Jones has got it, I don't know. I don't know which one of those is true. I'm not really that bothered which one is true. I do believe that the mercy seat of the ark will be recovered for when Jesus returns because that is the throne of David on which God is seated. So I do believe that there will be uh, the replica of the true ark in heaven for Jesus to reign on when he returns. But how that happens, where that happens, uh, I don't know. And no one does. It's circumstantial evidence. Believe any or neither of them, whichever you want. Okay, so why is the ark of God shown? What, what does anyone, what, I mean, it's called the ark. What's its real name? The, the mercy seat is the lid that goes on it. The ark of the... Yeah, why is it called the Ark of the Covenant? What is a covenant? It's it's a, it's 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 a con. I mean, it's 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 more legal than just a contract. It's the ultimate contract. It's called the covenant because God made a covenant with man, and for for a covenant to be ratified, there has to be two parties. That's why there's the Ark in heaven. That's why there's the Ark on earth. When you sign a contract, both parties have to sign it. When you get married, you both to agree. You can't, you know, if the husband signs the covenant of contract of marriage and the wife doesn't, you're not married. And so God is showing us, well, why does he show us the ark at this moment? Because despite everything that's going to happen on earth, God is still going to keep his promise. And he says, look, I've got the ark. I know what I promised. I know what I covenanted with my own blood. I know what I promised. Now, who was the covenant made with? The original covenant was made with Abraham, yes. But it was ratified then throughout the Old Testament, who was it made with? It was, it, was, it was made with Moses. Keep going, you'll get there. The Jews, the children of Israel. The covenant was for Abraham and his children. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, ratified through Moses. The covenant, God gave a covenant to David. One of your sons from your own lineage, your physical descendant of David, will sit on David's throne, will always reign over Jerusalem forever. God made a covenant, made a covenant with the priests, made, lot, made, made, several, made a covenant with Noah. The, the old earth wouldn't be destroyed by water again. I mean, it's going to be destroyed by fire, but God will keep that covenant. So God made these covenants. Right, now here's an interesting question. When we take communion, we ratify the covenant made in his blood. 
Jesus said, the new covenant. Who does he make the new covenant with? It's a bit of a trick question. Yes, it is with the believers, definitely. But who's the new covenant with? You see, the new covenant was prophesied in the Old Testament. Jeremiah prophesied it. Behold, I, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant. That's the covenant Jesus is making, the new covenant. Who's the new covenant made with? Because a lot of people think the new covenant's made with the church. And you know what? It isn't. It's still the new covenant with Israel. With Israel and the house of Judah. That's what the Bible says. Jesus is now ratifying that. But when he made that covenant in the upper room, everybody there was Jewish. The church, as we've seen in our, our studies recently, is grafted into that covenant. So now we have access to it. But not in spite of the Jews. Not instead of Israel. No, 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 no. If God can break, his co if God can break that covenant, then he can break anyone he's made with you. We are grafted into the promises of Israel. We don't replace them. Doesn't, God doesn't now say, oh, I've now got my church. Forget every promise I made to Israel. Absolutely not. So that's called replacement theology. That's what most Christian denominations teach, that the church has replaced Israel. You will not find in the New Testament that the church has replaced Israel. We now share in the promises of the new covenant, but we must not boast over the branches that were broken off because we're grafted into that olive tree. And that's what Paul talks about in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. Israel shall be saved. Why? God made a promise. And this is why at this moment he's showing that covenant. He's showing the Ark of the Covenant. He's saying, look, despite what's happening on earth, despite the turmoil and, and genocidal annihilation that is coming, remember, I've got a promise and I'm going to keep it. You've rejected me, I will still save you in the end, or at least save those who turn to me in the end. Okay? God keeps his covenant. So, he carries on then to the end. Uh, is that uh, the final verse of chapter 11? Can we go down one more verse? And so we go into chapter 12. Okay? So, that's the end of chapter 11. So now John is going to give us amplified information, a more extensive narrative, an exposition, if you like, of what now God is going to show him. So it's still chronologically in sort of the same order, but he's now going to show us something. And so we get into chapter 12. So can we go to chapter 12, verse 1? So the witnesses are dead. Antichrist is now seated in the temple. All this stuff's happening. Heaven has just declared now what's going to happen. We enter the final stage of the tribulation. We pass the halfway point. Right at this point, John is just explaining something, or God is just getting us to understand again what this is all about. Before he just gives us more information about what's going on, he says, right, let's just remember what all this is about. You need to grasp what the entire history of the world has been about. A great sign appeared in heaven. All right, we'll just stop there. I hope to get through chapter 12 tonight. We'll see how we're going on. We're not doing too well so far. So, what does John see? The third word. A sign. Yeah? Can we all read that? We all know what a, you know what a sign is. Because sometimes you've got to, when you read Revelation especially, understand the difference between something John sees, something that happens, something that's a description, a metaphor, something that's a sign. He sees a sign. Signs are important. Signs are beneficial. But signs have to be understood in the correct context. Signs are funny things, aren't they? Because some signs... You get so used to, you know what that sign means. I'm just talking about natural signs now, not signs and wonders. You just think of a sign. Um, 
In fact, put that, put one of the, put that first one up, please. Okay, can you see that? You're driving along in your car. That sign appears on your dashboard. Okay, what does that sign mean? Hazard warning lights. How do you know? How do you know it doesn't mean you are approaching two pyramids? <laughs> How do you know it doesn't mean campers ahead? How, what? How do you know it doesn't mean, you know, a, a, a vortex into a fourth dimension you are approaching? How do you know that means hazard warning lights? If you showed that to an Indian in the Amazon jungle, who'd never met anyone, and you says, there you go, would he go, ah, hazard warning lights? No. He would have no context or frame of reference he would have no way of knowing. The only way you know that means hazard warning lights is it's a uniform signal on car dashboards. But out of that context, it's meaningless. It's just a sign. What, what does it mean? You don't know what it means. Now, most signs we use in our entire society operate according to that principle. Without a frame of reference or a context, the sign doesn't mean anything. No one would guess what it means. You just wouldn't understand it. Look at, the, look at the next one. I think I've put a few of these just to try and get us to understand. Okay. What does that mean? You've all seen that sign. You've been on holiday, yeah? What does that sign mean? It means airport. What? How does that mean an airport? What, you're saying that's an aeroplane? Really? I mean, to me, that looks like a giant hand coming down out of the sky to pick up a pizza. <laughs> how, how, how do you think that means aeroplane? Because you have been conditioned through the symbolism and the context of being in an airport. It actually, it's the thing, it's the sign of departures. I think arrival, it looks like the plane's crashing you know, the, the other way around. But you only know the context. I mean, if you flip that on its side, can you flip that on its side? Next one down. Right? Now, if you show... That looks like a giraffe running away from a stick. <laughs> yeah? You wouldn't look at that. Your friend in the Amazon jungle again. Say, what is that? Ah, departures at an airport. We are going to miss our flight. He'd never come up with that interpretation because he has no understanding of what the sign means. We do. Now, signs, all signs, signs around the building, signs, traffic signs, car signs, home signs, and we live in the world of emojis. You know, people now send you stuff, don't they? And uh, I mean, you've got to now. Apparently, my children have told me, unless I send, like, a kiss, kiss sign. I mean, what is a kiss sign? How, how does that mean kiss? I mean, when I was at school and I got into trouble, the, the teacher would put that at the side of me getting something wrong. I mean, should I have thought she were giving me kisses? What, what does an X mean? You know, X-rays, clocks have an X on them, don't they? It means 10. But the context of the sign designates the meaning of that symbol. You'll see why I'm, I'm explaining this in a moment, because the signs John sees have lots of weird interpretations. Yeah? When you vote, you put an X, doesn't it? It doesn't mean you're kissing your candidate. It means you put in an X. It means yes. But my te the teacher, it meant no. When I send it to my wife, it means I love her. When it's on a clock, it means 10. Right? How can it mean all those different things? It's the context in which it is placed that designates the symbol. What does that mean? Disabled sign. How do you know that means a disabled sign? How do you know that? I mean, even if it means a disabled sign, well, what does it mean? Does it mean you can park there if you're disabled? So someone could park the car in our disabled toilet because there's a disabled sign. So as long as they're disabled, they can park the car in the toilet. No, that's not what it means. Well, that, well make your mind up. What does the sign mean? The context designates what the sign means. Now, you know that means a disabled sign, but it doesn't really look like a person in a wheelchair, does it? I know you think it does, because you're used to stick people. But if that means a person in a wheelchair, then what does the next sign mean? What's that? Well, that's obviously a wheelchair. 
Yeah? Go back. Go back. If that's a person in a wheelchair, if the person gets out the wheelchair, yeah, that's the wheelchair. So that's a wheelchair. Well, you don't look anything like a wheel. There's no one. You could forget the Amazon jungle Indian. Show that to the, the the person in charge of disability grants in Barnsley Council, and they wouldn't think that meant a wheelchair. Why? Because it's out of the context of the symbol. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I've done any more. Have I done another one? Oh yeah, that's a good one, isn't it? What does that mean? Food. It does, it does, it's a symbol for food, isn't it? Food ahead, if you see it at a, you know, on the motorway or, you know, food here. But how does that mean food? Because it's a knife and fork. Well, it looks a bit like a fork. I don't think if you ever saw something like that, you think it was a knife. But if you showed it again to the person in the Amazon jungle, they wouldn't think that meant food. They wouldn't know what it meant. In fact, even any, you showed it to someone in China in the 17th century, how would they know that meant food? They didn't even know what a knife and fork was. Yeah? Symbols. Revelation uses them a lot. The Bible uses them a lot. What's that? That's a heart, is it? That's a heart. Okay, what's the next one then? Which one's the heart? Because they don't look the same, do they? I mean, we go back to the nice one. You know, you put that on your text, don't you, on your, your Facebook messages. You know, I, I, you wouldn't put the next one down, would you? There you go, love. Blood every... No, it's like, ah, what's that? It's, it's a heart. I, I, I love you. Right, so why have I done that? I, I've done that to get us to understand how symbols work, signs and symbols. Because when we come to Revelation chapter 12, let's go back to the, the text. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. A great sign... Okay? You have to interpret the sign within the correct context. When we looked at those signs and we saw the, um, the hazard warning light, now, in modern cars, I've just bought a new car, there's loads of signs come up on my dashboard. I don't, Dave, I don't know what any of them mean. So what do I do? How do I... I can see what the symbol is, but I don't know what it's supposed to represent. How do I know? I go back to the manual. The manual will tell me what that sign is. Yeah? How do we know the signs that John is now going to see and he's going to record to us? He knows we've got the manual. So you interpret the sign according to what it says in the manual. Not according to what any Tom, Dick, or Harry tries to tell you what that sign means. It means what it says in the manual. It doesn't mean what the latest fruitcake on, on YouTube claims to interpret it means. It means what the manual says it means. Have we got that clear? We're only going to look at what the manual says these signs are, the Bible. Not what people try and interpret them to mean. Because there's, I'll, I'll show you one in a moment. This, this sign that we look at here, there's all kinds of weird explanations and interpretations about what this sign is. But the Bible's actually very clear about what it is. I saw a great sign in heaven, appeared a great sign in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. What John is now going to see is an overview of the entire history of mankind from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. Because it starts with this sign. A woman. Okay, let's read down. Let's read the next verse. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared. Okay, these are signs. An enormous red dragon with seven heads, ten hordes, seven crowns on its heads. We're not going to look at the heads, horns, and the crowns tonight. We'll look at them another time. Its tail swept a third of the stars. These are signs. Doesn't mean literally the stars in the sky are going to be swept down to earth by a dragon. They're signs. 
swept a third of the stars out of the sky, flank, flings the stars to earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of 1,260 days, 42 months, three and a half years. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient snake called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah, his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. Keep going. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony, they did not love their life so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness, where she will be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time, 42 months, three and a half years, 1,260 days, out of the snake's reach." So the snake, dragon is now called a snake. Then from his mouth, the snake spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with a torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Remember, these are signs. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony of Jesus. Go down one more verse. I know it's into the next chapter. Then the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns, seven heads. And this is where we see the Antichrist being revealed more, but that's in chapter 13. So let's go back to the beginning of chapter 12. So what is this sign? Who is this woman? Most theological Bible colleges and theological seminaries teach something that the Bible doesn't really agree with. Now, there's lots of different interpretations about who this woman is. I'm not going to cover what they all are. I've already had emails from people who I don't know from other countries who told me I better give the correct interpretation of this or they're going to expose me as a heretic. Well, I'm very sorry, but I'm going to give the biblical interpretation of what it is, not what everyone else wants me to say that it is. Who is this woman? Right, first of all, first of all, Here's what she's not. Can you put up the next slide, please, Ruth? Lots of people, lots of Christians use this interpretation. They claim the woman is a horoscope zodiac sign. Now, here's the thing. Whilst you might think... I don't agree with horoscopes and zodiacs. You've got to understand something. The original zodiac, uh, going back into history, the Hebrews called the Matzeroth, the 12 signs of the zodiac were actually 12 symbols of the 12 tribes of Israel. That's in a lot of synagogues. You will see that the 12 signs of the zodiac are in synagogues. They didn't believe in horoscopes. They believed that the sun, moon, and stars were signs of God's plan for redemption of the earth. Now, there is some biblical mandate for that because God himself in Genesis, when he created the world, said sun, moon, stars are symbols and signs for seasons 
and especially for what are called the moeds, the set times, the appointed times, the appointed feasts. The problem is, although that is true, Jesus said there will be signs in the heavens, signs in the sun, moon, and stars. Although all that is true, that has been so corrupted, especially by the Babylon system, system of what we would call the horoscopes, that I do not think you should be looking at that to try and work out what the future is or whether the signs are in accordance with anything. Now, this happened last year and the prophetic community was uh, very excited because Virgo, the woman, okay, was surrounded by the crown of stars and the sun and the moon came into the right, this all happened on one day, and out of where the woman, the inner being of the woman, the king star, Jupiter, would come out from where the woman was. That was the, the, the logic. And that hadn't happened for hundreds of years. And so people were saying, this is the sign as it comes at the Rosh Hashanah, the Moed. This is the sign that Jesus is coming or the rapture is happening or whatever, whatever. Now, some of you were here when that happened last year and I did actually mention it. And I actually told you, don't believe it. Okay? Because the Bible doesn't tell us that that's what it is. Okay, however much you try and work at stuff like that, we don't study the stars to understand the future. There might be signs, but that is not what we do. So I do not believe it's got anything to do with that, despite what a lot of people are talking about. I don't think you to take up the astrological system of looking at things at all. I think we have to stick with what the manual tells us. Yeah? There's lots of symbols come up on my dashboard and I've thought it meant something, but when I've checked the manual, it, it meant something else. I mean, something came up, Carolyn told me the other day, uh, we were on there and this sign came up and I thought it was a really big thing. Apparently I'd take my seatbelt off before the car had stopped and that's all the symbol meant. I thought I needed to take the car back to the, you know, to the garage and get it fixed. But no, I just got to keep my seatbelt on until we come to a total stop. So some people think it's that. Some people think it's Mary. People, especially people in the Catholic Church, they think that now Mary has been glorified. She's the woman in heaven, and she's the one with the star, the crown of stars on her head. A lot of Catholic uh, iconography actually portrays Mary in that way, that we can pray to Mary because she's now glorified in heaven. I don't believe it's that either. Now, some people think it's the church, which may come as a shock to you, but it's, I don't think it's the church either for a variety of reasons. One, that she's pregnant and the church is supposed to be a virgin bride. So, you know, who's made her pregnant? Uh, secondly, um, the church didn't give birth to Jesus and then Jesus get ascended into heaven. It was, the, we're the bride, not, not this woman. And so what is this woman? Well, if we go to Genesis chapter 37 and verse 9... Genesis chapter 37 and verse 9, the Bible tells us what it is. If you want to know what something is in Revelation, a good rule of thumb, go to Genesis and find out what it originally meant. You know, because what is the conclusion of the Bible is the understanding of what God said in the beginning. So if what God said it was in Genesis, that's what going to be the conclusion is in Revelation. So here in Genesis, can you remember Joseph's dreams? What did he have a dream of? He said, listen, I had another dream. And he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. Okay, read down. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, now listen to what his dad says the dream means. What is this dream you had? Will your mother and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now, who was Joseph's dad? Israel. Who, it, what is this? According to Israel, Jacob, and Joseph, 
What are the stars and the sun and the moon? What is this sign? It's the nation of Israel. Because this is the first time in the Bible that the nation of Israel exists. Abraham had existed. Isaac had existed. Jacob had existed on his own. But he wasn't called Israel until here. The, actually, the, 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 the previous chapter is where God changes his name to Israel. And he has the 12 tribes of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. So this is the first time that Israel, as a nation, there's still only 70 of them, if you include all wives and children, the 12 stars. So this is the first time Israel exists, and we're told that according to Joseph the prophet and his prophecy is that it's the stars, the sun, and the moon. It's a picture of Israel. Now, when you understand that, and it's mentioned elsewhere in the Bible, the whole logic of the signs in Revelation 12 makes sense. Where does the man-child come from? Israel. Everything revolves around Israel, especially at this time in the three and a half year period in Revelation. So we understand Israel himself, Jacob, says it's Israel. Yeah? Not horoscope. We looked at the manual. Oh, it's a, and Jacob's saying, oh, it's about us, this. J Joseph is seeing a dream about his family, the nation of Israel, the stars, the sun, the moon, this woman. Now, it's interesting that throughout the whole Old Testament, Israel is always described as in travail as of the pains of labor ready to give birth. Over and over again, especially Isaiah and Jeremiah repeat this repeatedly. Israel is in labor until the time that she who gives birth. And who does Israel birth? The Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus himself, right? Right back at the beginning of Genesis, what was the original promise? Genesis 3, 15. What was the original promise? What was the original curse? What was the original instruction to Satan? I will put empty between you and the woman. Which woman? Between you and her, your offspring and hers, he will crush your head. You will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. You, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. That was said right at the beginning while he was still in the garden. What we get in Revelation is the consummation of that. Now everything is going to be fulfilled. The child's been born. He's come out of Israel. He's ascended into heaven. He's going to come back and rule. Satan knows this. That's why he has to kill the child. And if he can't kill the child, he'll kill the woman. Now, a lot of this does apply to the church. A lot of it does apply to the church. You'll see why in a moment. But if you go to Micah 4 and verse 9, Micah, Micah chapter 4 and verse 9, this is another prophet describing this. Now he's describing Israel. Why do you cry aloud? Have you no king? Has your ruler perished? That pain seizes you like that of a woman in labor. What's Micah saying here? He's saying, you think you've no king. He's speaking to Israel. But the king has been born. But now you're going through the labor pains again because you've not accepted him. And that's why the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation, this period of terrible destruction that's coming on earth is described by the prophets as the woman in labor pains because she has to now come to the point where she's going to accept her Messiah has to come. Writhe in agony, daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor, for now you must leave the city. Where does the woman go in Revelation 12? Leaves the city, goes into the desert. It's all been prophesied previously. You must leave the city, camp in the open field. You will go to Babylon. There you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you out of the hand of your enemies. But now many nations are gathered against you. They say, let her be defiled. Let our eyes gloat over Zion. And Micah goes on to describe. He's describing this terrible time at the end where Israel is going to go into severe convulsions until Jesus comes. 
So we see that this woman is primarily a picture of Israel. Yeah? Now, throughout the Bible, and especially if you've read my book, you understand the woman is also a picture of the church. Why is that? Well, is it Israel or is it the church? Well, you've got to understand, uh, I like to put it like this, there's two women in God's life. Yeah? I know we wouldn't want that. That would be a, a nightmare. Well, it, it was for Jacob, actually, when he had two wives. It, he wished he'd not, but because they just uh, got jealous of each other. Now, you'll notice in the Bible, uh, Genesis 2, no, Genesis 20 and verse 11, you'll notice that the woman, to start with, has two descriptions of her. Abram replied to us, I said to myself, there is surely no fear of God in this place. They will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not of my mother, and she became my wife. It's very interesting that the first woman God uses in the nation of Israel is described as sister and bride. Right? Which, according to our understanding, you can't, it can't be both. You've got a sister or you've got a bride, but you can't marry your sister. And in the beginning, this is sort of what happened. And so you find this phrase, sister, bride. It's in the Song of Songs an awful lot. Song of Songs chapter 4 and verse 12. Now, if you've read my book, you'll understand a, a lot of what I'm going to say. You are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. Well, which one is she? She can't be your sister and your bride. Yeah, but the, the, the woman is. Because God's got two women in his life. You see, Israel is his flesh and blood. Jesus was a Jew. His sister. And he intended to take his people as his bride, Israel. In fact, in the Old Testament, Israel is called the wife of Yahweh. But in the New Testament, the church is called the bride of Christ, which is, is different the wife of Yahweh is slightly different than the bride of Christ. God still wants to save his flesh and blood, the Israelites, his sister. But his bride is the one he is going to take to possess for himself. Now, remember the bride is made up of Jew and Gentile. It's not excluding the Jews. It was supposed to be the Jews, but it includes Gentiles. That's why you find Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all married their close relatives. Jacob married his, uh, Abraham married his half-sister. Isaac married his cousin. So did Jacob. But have you noticed, when God had got Israel, the patriarchs all married their close relatives. But as soon as Israel was born and became a nation, Judah, Joseph, and then the generations down, Moses, who did they marry? Gentiles. Now, was that an accident or is God showing us a prophetic destiny? Because Jacob actually told his sons they mustn't marry a Canaanite. Who did Judah marry? The most important of his sons. He married a Canaanite. And then he had children through Tamar, a Canaanite. And the tribe of Judah through Jesus came through a woman that was never supposed to have been married in the first place. And then you got Boaz marrying Ruth, who was a Moabite. You weren't supposed to marry Moabites. Yeah, and then Moses married Zipporah, who was a Midianite. Well, Midianites were Israel's enemies. And then Joseph married an Egyptian, a Senath. What a mess. Yeah, but you see, God's showing us the sisters and the bride, and that he actually wants them to be the same. Can we see that? And so when we say the woman, the woman is usually a picture of the church, certainly in the New Testament and symbolically in the Old Testament. But remember, it's also a picture of Israel. God, Jesus came to save Israel, just like Jacob came to get Rachel and ended up marrying Leah and then had to get Rachel seven years later. It's a direct picture of the great tribulation. Jesus takes his bride and then seven years later gets the other bride, the other woman, Israel, he came to save so that they can all be united to their Messiah. So can we see that? I hope I've tried to explain that a little bit. And that's why you'll find Moses had a big argument in his family. Do you know who it was between? His sister and his bride. Miriam didn't like Zipporah. Yeah? 
the Jews don't like the church. Paul says they're aroused to jealousy. The Jews don't like the church because we love the Messiah and they don't. And if there's anything that winds someone up, it's when someone that you should have loved loves somebody else more than you. Am I right, ladies? Men? Whoever? Yeah? If you love somebody and that person loves somebody else more than they love you, you don't like that, do you? Miriam didn't like Zipporah because she was not a Jew. And what did God say when he came down? He said, put Miriam outside the camp for seven days. Put Israel outside the camp for this sevenfold process till they learn, I do love them, but they should have been my bride. I don't love them more than my bride. Remember, that's why the Jews hated Jesus, because he loved Samaritans and they didn't like Samaritans. So we see the symbolism. If you've read my book, you understand all that. So the woman is a picture of Israel, okay? I know she's usually a picture of the church, but in this instance, she's a picture of Israel, especially going back to the promise of Eve, that the woman is going to birth the child, okay? So Israel is going to birth the son. Who is the son? Jesus. Okay, Revelation chapter uh, 12 and verse 5. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with a iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God, to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of 1,260 days. So the woman gives birth to a son. Israel gave birth to the Messiah. Jesus was born, just as what was prophesied, exactly at the right time, in the right place, in Bethlehem, of the right line of the tribe of Judah, born of a virgin, just as been prophesied by Isaiah. Isaiah uh, came to crush the serpent's head, just as had been prophesied back in the, in the garden. The woman had birthed the child. Then the woman had to flee into the desert. Yeah? When Jesus ascended up to heaven, what happened to Israel? They had to flee into the desert. They were destroyed as a nation, the very same generation. Where did they actually flee, the, 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 the Jewish believers? Does anybody know? They fled over, over the Jordan to a place called Pella. Uh, into the the place of Jordan, actually, what is now Jordan, Moab, and Ammon it was in the time of uh, the Old Testament. And so they were fled there into the wilderness, and they were protected. That happened in the past. It happened in the ancient past. It's going to happen again in this seven-year period. One of the important things to understand about We've already looked at this in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12 especially. When is all this happening? Has it happened in the past? Is it happening now? Is it going to happen in the future? And the answer is all three. It happened. It's happening. It's going to happen again on a much bigger scale. Remember, prophecy always follows that pattern. Don't just try and limit it. So in the time of Jesus, this is exactly what happened. The man-child Jesus was ascended up into heaven. Yeah? The Jewish believers had to flee into the desert where they were protected by God for that period. When Elijah fled to the same place, the other side of Jordan, how long was he protected for and fed for? Three and a half years. 1,260 days. You see, they're following the same Old Testament pattern, and they will do in the future. Jesus says, when you see these things, what did he say? Flee to the desert, to the mountains over the other side of the Jordan, which is a desert region. Jesus prophesied it. It happened. It's going to happen again. So she gives birth to the man-child. Now, there are different interpretations of who the man-child is. Now, I think it's self-evident who the man-child is, because if you go to Revelation 19 and verse 15, if you go to Revelation 19 and verse 15, when Jesus returns, the rider on the white horse, whose name is the Word of God, this is obviously Jesus, the King of kings, Lord and lords. No one disagrees for a minute that this isn't Jesus. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword, strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. Yeah? So the man-child is the one who rules with an iron scepter. Well, Jesus, in the very same book, is the one who rules with an iron scepter. Actually, that phrase occurs four times in the Bible. It's always referring to Jesus. 
Even way back in Genesis, Judah was told that the one from the line of Judah, he was called Shiloh, Shiloh, the, the ruler, until the scepter comes to him, the iron scepter to rule comes to the one who he belongs. It was a prophecy all the way through the Bible. He was the man-child who would be born. He would be the seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. So I think it self-evidently is Jesus. There are some people who claim that the man-child is the church. Now, just bear with me now, because it does follow some sort of logic, because just as the man-child is raptured up to heaven, so the church is raptured up to heaven. And although the man-child is Jesus, we are the body of Christ, so we are raptured up to heaven heaven and so they they did they they follow this logic that this is actually the look talking about the rapture of the church who came out of israel the woman now i think you have to do some theological gymnastics to make that fit now i don't disagree with the ultimate theology of it the church is going to be raptured uh, and we are the body of christ and we i don't disagree with it in uh, its its ultimate logic i just think the manual clearly points out that this is Jesus. So I think it's obvious that you stick with Jesus because it's not just repeated here, it's repeated in, in other places as well. The one who rules with this iron scepter, the, the, the son of God himself, Jesus Christ, okay? So this is who I think uh, it, it refers to. Now, what does the dragon want to do? Kill the child as soon as he's born. When Jesus was born, isn't that exactly what the Antichrist tried to do? What did Herod want to do? Kill him as soon as he was born. Kill the children. This pattern's repeated all the way uh, through the Bible, even in the time of Moses. What did Pharaoh want to do? Kill all the babies. Yeah? So that no one would come to redeem Israel. It's that anti-Semitic pattern of destroying the children before they are born. We have a similar thing in operation in our society today. The number of abortions. Who knows who, who we've killed? Who God might have sent to help us? We, we don't know. So this is the child. Isaiah 9 verse 5. The prophets talk about this child that would come. I know this is obvious to us. But it's still important just to reinforce what Revelation is talking about here. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Now, he's actually talking about the tribulation period. But this is when Isaiah says this. We repeat this at Christmas. It's not actually got anything to do with Christmas. For unto us a child is born. And to us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Go down. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. Where's David's throne? Jerusalem. Yeah? Has Jesus ever reigned on David's throne? No. Is Isaiah telling the truth? Was Gabriel telling the truth? Was God telling the truth? Well, they all said Jesus is coming to reign on David's throne. So that means he's going to be the king of Israel. And he's going to reign from Jerusalem. Not just in heaven. Remember, the ark's in heaven, but it's also going to be on earth. Jesus is in heaven, but he's coming back to earth. So he's going to reign, establishing, upholding with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. Forever. Okay, so it's clearly been prophesied this is going to happen. So Jesus here in this vision is caught up to heaven here in Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation 19, exactly the same description. The one who rules with an iron scepter is going to come back and conquer all evil finally. So this is what we're seeing here. It's a reference to the first coming and the second coming. You'll find in the Bible, the, the first coming and the second coming are often stated at exactly the same time. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's just a poetic way of saying the same thing. No, 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 it's talking about two different things. There was a child born, but then a son's going to be given. Yeah, two comings. There's many times in the Bible, there's something said, but it's said twice in two different ways. And it actually is referring to both separate events. But it's said in one statement, so we think it's all the same thing. That's why the Jews didn't understand the difference. 
because they thought it all happened when he came the first time. There's actually a gap between the first and the second coming. And so what is the gap? He's ascended into heaven with the iron scepter before he comes back with the iron scepter to rule. Okay, so let's go back to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. So what happens... At this point, past, present, and future, it's always the same pattern. War breaks out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough. They lost their place in heaven. Okay, let's read down a little bit. The great dragon was hurled down the ancient snake called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And then we hear a loud voice. We'll not look at that. Okay, next person. In this vision, the next sign is a great red dragon. Yeah? So we've seen the woman, we've seen the man-child, now we see the great red dragon. So God goes into detail describing what's going to happen with this great red dragon. Remember what we've said throughout this study. God's got bigger problems than you. I mean, you're a big enough problem for God, but he's got bigger problems than you. He's not just dealing with man's sin. He's dealing with the heavenly rebellion of Satan. He's dealing with the angelic rebellion of the fallen angels, and he's dealing with man's rebellion, Babylon on earth. He's going to deal with that next. But he's giving us an overview of everything that's happened so we can grasp what this is. Okay, who is the big red dragon? Satan. How do you know it's Satan? Because he says so. Yeah, good answer. Yeah, right. Now, who is this big red dragon? If you go to verse 3 of chapter 12, we're not going to look at this tonight. We'll look at this next time when we're going to chapter 13. Chapter 13 is where it really gets wild. Um, then another sign appeared in heaven, enormous red dragon, seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns. What are the seven heads? What are the ten horns? What are the seven crowns? It will tell us in the next section. It represents kings, kingdoms, empires, nations. Okay? We'll look at that next time. By the way, the crowns he's got, it's a totally different word than the crowns the church gets. The church gets a Stephanos, the word Stephen. It means uh, a crown that you've earned. That is a diadem. It's like a crown you've got just by authority, like a king. I mean, you've earned it. It just means you've got it. Okay, it's different than the crowns that the church gets. So this is what this dragon is ultimately going to represent, kingdoms and empires. Now, who is he? If you go to Daniel 8 and verse 9, remember Daniel's already told us all about this. Daniel 8 and verse 9, let's just read down. So Daniel's describing this beast, and it describes this beast has horns as well. And then out of them came another horn. So despite this beast having these horns, there's another horn comes up. This horn is the Antichrist. We know this from the other chapters, but we haven't got time to to go into that now. Which started small, but grew in power to the south and the east towards the beautiful land. That's the land of Israel. It grew until it reached the host of heavens. It threw some of the starry host down to earth and trampled on them. Daniel's already told us this beast, this creature that has these horns, is going to pull the stars out of heaven. What are the stars? Angels. How do we know they're angels? Angels. As he tells us in Revelation, the stars represent angels. Now, there's literal stars, and then there's the representations of stars. But we're looking at signs. They're not literal stars, because they're signs. So the angels. It set itself up as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. He claims he's the king of the heavenly host. But who is the captain of the heavenly host? Jesus took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord, and his sanctuary was thrown down, destroys, desecrates the temple. Because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did. Truth was thrown to the ground. It kills the two witnesses. There's no truth. Everyone has to worship this beast. He's the Antichrist. Daniel's already prophesied it. We're seeing the sign here now in Revelation chapter 12. What he's going to do at this stage. So, we know he's Satan because it says he's Satan. Yeah? Yeah, but what does Satan mean? You see, in Hebrew, it it wasn't a a personal pronoun originally. 
Now, I think I've put a little chart together of the things that are described here, just in Revelation chapter 12. Can you put up that next chart, please? Chart number 10. Okay, so on the left there, you've got a list of who this red dragon is. We can see here who he is, what he's doing. Okay, he's a dragon, he's Satan, he's called the ancient serpent, he's called the devil, he's called the deceiver. You read the King James, he's the one who deceives the whole world. He's called the accuser, the accuser of the brethren, and he's a murderer, he's, he's killing people. Okay, so you've got seven attributes of this dragon here. Yeah? You've got to understand God uses a different term for the devil, Satan, this thing, this being, this fallen cherub, this Lucifer, whoever we want to call him. Each one of these terms is a representation of his attributes. Now, you need to understand how evil he is. He's actually called the evil one, Jesus called him. Okay, he's called the prince of the power of the air. He's called the ruler of this world. He's called the prince of demons. He's called the ruler of this age. He's called the ruler of this whole world. You've got to understand every, something, right? I know you know this. There isn't heaven, hell, and an in-between neutral ground, no man's land, the earth. That is a totally unbiblical way of looking at things. There is... Those who belong in heaven and those who belong to Satan. There is those only, only those two realms. Jesus said the whole world lies under the control of the evil one. Jesus came to rescue us from that. He didn't come to stop us from choosing to belong to the devil. We're already under his control. He runs this world. That's biblical understanding. It's actually very clear. Satan rules this world. He's been cast to earth. He's going to be cast to earth again. Okay, so who is the dragon? What, what is a dragon? Now, we tend to think of dragons as like mythological creatures, you know, in Cinderella, don't we? Guarding the castle where the princess is going to be rescued from. I think that mythology actually comes from the, the original understanding. Is there such a thing as real dragons? What do you think? You don't answer, do you? you? What is a dragon? A huge reptilian creature. Yeah? Has there ever been huge reptilian creatures walking this earth? Okay. Did mankind ever meet any of them? Well, paleontologists will tell you that we didn't. Do you know every single culture, going back to the earliest recordings we have, even going back to uh, cave drawings of thousands of years ago, every, and this is, a, this is a universal rule, they all record these huge reptilian creatures. Doesn't matter where you go, you can go to China, Korea, Japan, they all, in their ancient manuscripts and ancient past, record things they call dragons. Huge reptilian creatures that were so fearsome, you know, everyone was terrified of them. You can go to Latin America, Aztecs, Inca, they have the same iconography. Huge reptilian creatures called dragons. It's the same in Europe. It's certainly the same in the Middle East. As far back as we can go uh, to the ancient Sumerians, Akkadians, Chaldeans, Mesopotamians, Paleo-Babylonians, they all recorded what they called dragons, huge reptilian creatures. Now, a lot of modern scientists, not all of them, a lot of modern scientists would say they just made it up. They all made up the same lie that turned out to be true because we dug them up in the 1850s, that there actually were huge, large reptiles walking the earth. Now, you'd have to be an imbecile to believe that. That just flies against all laws of probability. If you have all this evidence and then you find out it's true, guess what? It's true. Right? You can't dismiss it as all just being a hypothetical guess from thousands of cultures that had no contact with each other and they all made up the same myth. That's nonsense. 
the laws of probability are just absurd to come to that conclusion. So what does the Bible say about it? Well, if you go to Psalm 74, verse 12 there, Psalm 74 and verse 12, if you've read your Bible a lot, you'll actually know the Bible talks an awful lot about these large reptiles. Now, you can use whatever word you want. I mean, we tend to use the word dinosaur, don't we? Which just means terrible lizard in the original language. It just means a large lizard-like creature. That's what it means. But to say that it's different just because you use different words, that's just childish. But God is my king of long ago. He brings salvation to the earth. It was you split open the sea by your power. You broke the heads of the monster in the waters. It was you who crushed the heads of Leviathan and gave it as food to the creatures of the desert. Right, you'll find that phrase there, that word in uh, verse 14, that word Leviathan, which is repeated throughout the Bible. What is a Leviathan? Now, some, some Bible will say it's a crocodile. It is not a crocodile. This thing was the monster that inhabited the earth. It was huge. It was this large reptilian creature. All, cult all cultures, not just the Hebrew Bible, but you go back into the, uh, the Mesopotamian manuscripts, epics of Gilgamesh, Chal Chaldean, Sumerian. They talk about the same thing. They call them the, the, the Tanim, this, these huge reptiles, this dragon-type thing that had authority that no one could tame. They all talk about it. It's called the, sometimes it's called the sea monster. It's called the chaos monster. It's as if everything represented by this dragon, this creature, represents chaos. That's why it's often linked as being in the waters, because the, the, the waters become chaotic. And it's a representation of everything that's bad. But all ancient cultures talked about it as if it was real. And I don't think they were dumb. I actually think they were cleverer than us. I think they are harking back to the original understanding of the original dragon, Satan himself, who was cast to earth. Now, we know he was in Eden. But in Eden, he wasn't called the dragon. We know in Revelation 13, the dragon is going to bring another beast out of the sea. But he's going to be a, like a man. Antichrist. So he's called all these different things. So if we go back to the chart, he's called also in Revelation 12, he's called Satan. Now, Hasatan in Hebrew means the accuser. It literally just meant someone who accused. But then throughout the Bible, from Genesis onwards, it started to become an actual pronoun of a specific person. This dragon this reptile. In Job, he's there, Satan, and Job again talks about Leviathan, this reptile. And in Chronicles there, we don't need to turn to it, he's the accuser. He rises up to accuse David and causes turmoil in David's kingdom. He incites rebellion. He's the Satan, the accuser. I've, I've spoke to uh, Jewish people in, in, in Israel, and they still call him the Satan to identify him as, as one specific uh, entity. Okay. He's also called in Revelation 12. That these are all in just in Revelation 12. These there's lots of other names from throughout the Bible. He's called the ancient serpent. So it's the same thing. Dragon, Satan. He's the ancient serpent. Who's the ancient serpent? He's the one who was in Eden. Remember serpent doesn't mean snake. It came to mean snake. The Hebrew word nakash it, we don't really know what it was. It was a large reptile-type, massive creature-type thing. Cherubim, probably. What did he do? He was crafty, and he brought lies to the woman. Right? Satan is called a different name dependent on how he is acting. He can be all these. So he's called the devil. The devil, the root word of the, of the word devil means slanderer, the one who slanders. Uh, he appears there in Matthew 4. He's the devil who comes to even attack Jesus. So if he's, if he's, if he's going to attack Jesus, he's going to attack you. Okay, he tempts. He came to tempt Jesus. I'll give you something if you listen to me. 
He's called the deceiver there in Revelation 12. He deceives the whole world. Paul writes to the church and says, I'm afraid that Satan has deceived you. Deceit is the single biggest warning we have received in the New Testament. When Jesus talks of the end times, and he talks about all these earthquakes and famines and terrible things, the number one thing he talks about is being deceived, believing something that's not true. The horrible thing about deceit is you don't know you've been deceived. You need someone else to tell you. And your own pride won't let someone else tell you. And that's why you're deceived. We don't like it. Some of us would rather be deceived and say we're right than be told the truth than have to admit we're wrong. That's what the pride led Satan to become this in the first place. Over and over again, in Job it says, the Leviathan's tongue cannot be tamed. You can't stop him telling lies. He tells you 90% truth and 10% lie to get you to act according to the 10%. He got a third of the angels to follow him. He can certainly get a third of the church to follow him. He's that deceitful. He slanders. He lies. He's crafty. He's manipulative. He opens his mouth and brings a flood in Revelation chapter 12. He does the same now. He opens his mouth and he brings this chaos. He's the accuser. The accuser of the brethren there. When you go to Mark 3 and verse 12, you'll find that those who belong to the devil were always looking. He actually uses this phrase. They were looking, they were asking Jesus questions. They were looking for an occasion to accuse him. Yeah? He's always adversarial. He doesn't ask questions to gain information. He asks questions to undermine your understanding of truth that's why he's called the adversary that's another one of his names the adversary satan and he's a murderer he's trying to kill the child he's going to kill the offspring of the child he tries to kill the woman jesus says you you are of your father the devil he was a murderer from the beginning cain was said that he was of the evil one he murdered in the beginning it was it was satan behind cain's murder of abel He's the destroyer. He's the evil one. So they're attributes of Satan. Why is that important to know? Because they are the exact same. They are, they are the exact opposite attributes of what a Christian should have. Yeah. A Christian does not create chaos. We don't create confusion. We create unity and harmony. A Christian does not incite people to take their side. Now, I know some of you have been in lots of other churches and some of you have been in these churches and you've known Christians who are more like that than they are like Jesus. Because that's what Satan does. What does he do? He craftily incites people to take their side. He uses slander. He speaks against people, especially people in leadership. He gets you to be adversarial. He's cunning to deceive you into thinking bad of the people God has sent you to do good. And before you know it, you are believing what they say so that you can't receive the good because you've already accepted the false. Because the person God sends to do you good, you don't believe them. You believe the person who slandered them. Even though the person who slandered them isn't helping you at all. That's how Satan is. And his ultimate intent is to murder, is to kill the church, kill the spirit of unity, kill the spirit, kill Christians, destroy everything that God wants to build. And he got a third of the angels to follow him. So he can certainly get a third of the church to believe him. So we need to bear that in mind. Now, his ultimate tactic is to destroy not just the church, but to destroy Israel. It will always lead to anti-Semitism. Satan's tactics always lead that way. That's why I've just put up this next chart, and we'll just start to bring this to a close now. Throughout the Bible, you will find that Satan's plan has been to kill the Jewish promise. Right from the beginning, right to the end. He did it in the garden. He was going to try and kill. What did he do? He wanted to kill Eve's son. Killed Abel. Why? Because he knew the seed of the woman was going to kill his head, was going to crush him. So he has to destroy everything that comes from Israel, which includes the church. 
Genesis 6, he tried to do it with the Nephilim, the fallen angels. He tried to infiltrate mankind so that he would pollute mankind's very DNA so that man would have to be destroyed. Mankind was almost destroyed. God will always destroy everything satanic. Always remember that. Always. In Exodus 1, he used Pharaoh to kill all the Jewish babies. In Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar made everyone worship in, or they'd be thrown into the fire, or then later into the lion's dead under the Persian kings. He always works through the satanic empires. Egypt, Babylon, Greece, Persia, Rome, and then the final empire that's coming at the end in the tribulation period, which may already be here. Okay, did it with the Persians. Remember Haman's genocide there in Esther. What did he do? We're going to kill all the Jews. But Esther petitioned the king and they were saved. Matthew, it's the same. Jesus said, uh, when Jesus was born, what did Herod do? Try and kill all the baby boys. You've got to kill the promise. Got to destroy this promise. In Luke 19, Jesus said the same thing. They're going to come. They're going to kill all your children. Don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves. Because you've rejected God. The only thing that's coming is destruction for your entire nation. Okay. Why is Satan doing this? Hasn't he already lost? Yes, he has already lost. He cannot take away your salvation. But remember what the ultimate promise is. The ultimate promise of the covenant was Jesus to return to reign in Israel. If he can destroy the Jews, then Jesus can't come back. So all of Satan's efforts now are in the destruction of the Jewish nation. And you don't need to be a genius to know that that is what the whole attention of the world is focused on. This tiny little nation that half the world wants to go away. And the church as well, because we believe the promises. The true church. So he's trying to destroy it all. He has to. It's his only last hope. The only hope he has. He can't do anything about the church. I mean, he can persecute us, but the church of the living God is alive. Jesus is building his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. He cannot do anything to anyone who's been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But he thinks he can still destroy Israel. So that's why the dragon is now persecuting the woman. He's going to destroy Israel. He's going to try. He won't, although it'll, it'll seem like he's almost achieved it. And it's not just there. there that's just the biblical. That's just the biblical examples, and there's more than that. Even if you just take the last 2,000 years, if you go to the next chart, okay, just as we, as Jesus prophesied, Jerusalem was destroyed by Titus, but a lot of people fail to understand, in the second century, the Jews still existed in Israel. But then Hadrian, there was another revolt under a man called Bar Kokhba, and when Hadrian put that, down, put that revolt down, he cast all the Jews out of Israel. He plowed Jerusalem under. He set up his own city called Aelia Capitolina. And, he, and the Jews had never been back to Israel since that time. There'd be one or two living there, but it was always under another empire. They were scattered throughout the nations. That was 2,000 years ago. They were scattered into Europe throughout the Middle Ages. They were put into ghettos. They were taxed. Did you know Britain threw them all out in the Middle Ages? We expelled all the Jews from Britain, persecuted them terribly. They were allowed back under Cromwell's reign. Cromwell understood from the Bible that we would be blessed if we blessed the Jews. So in the 1600s, they were allowed back, and they've been back since then. And we're still, uh, thankfully, most of our nation is still relatively friendly towards the Jews. The minute we, we betray them, we've had it as a nation, by the way. The Spanish Inquisition that so many people quote, that was actually about persecuting Jews. Did you know that? They then applied it to Protestants, but it was originally, in Europe, it was about uh, persecuting Jews, killing Jews unless they converted to Christianity. That's, that's re really what the Spanish Inquisition was set up for. Everything else about it came after that. Then there was the pogroms in Russia, if you're aware of that, where the Jews were massively uh, killed on a massive scale and persecuted. Then obviously the Holocaust that we're familiar with under the Nazis, where they tried to obliterate the Jewish race. Uh, presently we've got the Islamic threat. Most Islamic nations want all Jews dead. You know, I, I find it incredible when people are saying that, you know, Israel and Hamas should make peace. Well, Hamas, as aim, is to kill every Jew. How can you make peace with someone that wants to kill everybody in your nation? 
I mean, it's just nonsense, isn't it? And people say the peace process. What, what peace process? I mean, I'm not saying all Muslims want that, but Hamas and Hezbollah do. That's their stated aim, to wipe Israel off the map. And that's happening right now. And then there's the final one coming, which we're already entering into, where we, you can read there in Zechariah 30, uh, Zechariah 13 and Jeremiah 10. Do you go to Jeremiah 30 and verse 6? Because this sort of just pulls together this vision in uh, Revelation chapter 12. Ask and see, can a man bear children? What's Jeremiah seeing? Labor pains. Why do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor, every first turn deathly pale? He's talking about the, the final day, the day of the Lord, the end times for Israel. How awful that day will be. No other will be like it. It will be a time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be saved out of it. Why will they be saved? Because they'll cry out for Messiah. They'll declare Jesus is Lord, Yeshua, and he comes. That's at the end of the three and a half years. And it's also it's talked about all the way through the Bible, but we, we don't have time to go into that. Zechariah talks about it an awful lot. So this is what's happening. Now, even as someone who's no, I've never read the Bible, suppose someone's an atheist, they've never read the Bible. If you summed up the last 3,000 years of human history, there's one constant running through the entire history of this world. This world wants to get rid of the Jews. Why? There's hardly any of them. I mean, the nation of Israel is smaller than London. The entire nation. It's a tiny little speck. You, you zoom out, you can't even see the country. Why do they want to destroy the Jews? You know, King Frederick of Europe in the 1700s, he once asked his physician, he said, I want you to give me an infallible proof that God exists. And his physician came to him, he says, I have an infallible proof that God exists. And he says, what is it? He said, the Jews. If you understand the Jews, that is enough proof there's a God. Because for 3,000 years, everybody on the planet has tried to eliminate them. They've cast them out their land, they've banned their Bibles, they've banned their language, they've persecuted them to annihilation and Holocaust levels, and yet they still exist, they're still in Israel. Jerusalem's still the capital. And they're still speaking Hebrew and they're still reading the same Bible. That is impossible. There is no people group on earth that has gone anywhere near that. Most people groups, after four generations, they, don't, they can't speak the language, they don't know where the country is, they know nothing. Thousands of years since the times of the Gentiles, since the Babylonians, they've never been in control of their nation till now. 3,000 years. That's the proof. This is why the dragon wants to kill the woman. But there's going to be a big battle. Michael is going to arise. Michael always fights on behalf of Israel. And there's going to be a war, a war in heaven, a war on earth. And Satan is going to be ultimately defeated when the King of Kings returns in Revelation chapter 19. But first, John is going to give us descriptions of what happens in these battles and what happens in Revelation chapter 13 when he describes Antichrist's empire and the beasts, the Leviathans that take on human form and control this world. But we'll look at that next time. Amen. 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 Well, God bless you all.